and welcome to episode two of the Pi Podcast, the show by members of the Raspberry Pi community for the Raspberry Pi community. I'm Joe. I'm Isaac. And I'm Albert. And coming up, we'll be covering some news and projects and talking to Michael Horn and Tim Richardson about Pi Wars. But before we get into that, I understand you've got hold of a code bug, Albert. Yeah, the code bug, it um, was a Kickstarter earlier this year. It's a small little board that you get to play with. It's got a couple of connectors on it and also has a, a nice little 5x5 five five LED display. You program it using kind of a scratch type interface. The really cool things about it are to upload your code, you just drag and drop a file onto it as if it's a, a drive. So it'll work in anything with a web browser. And also I just found out today that you can attach it to the Raspberry Pi using I2C and tether it. So it effectively just becomes a, a little plug-in board with extra inputs and also with a, a 5x5 display that you can play with uh, using the Raspberry Pi. Ah, so you don't need another computer to use it then, just need a Pi and this code bug. Yeah, I mean, you can use it through a web browser with the Raspberry Pi. You can actually program the code bug so it'll function standalone. So you upload your code to it like an Arduino, and it'll then just work on its own. But if you program it over I2C, then it's a tethered device, so it has to stay attached to the Raspberry Pi. So it actually can be used in both ways using the Raspberry Pi, which is fantastic. And only £12.50 from Element 14 in the UK. Yeah, they just started selling them. Um, I got mine from the Kickstarter, and because I went for the Experimenter kit, it came to me after Elements 14 started selling them in the UK for twelve fifty, including VAT and uh, delivery from their website. So they're available now. Oh, great. It's a heck of a steal. Well then, let's talk about some news. So the first news story is that the Sense Hat is available to buy. Now, this is a very interesting add-on board that's got an 8x8 LED matrix that's 15-bit color resolution, RGB, and a joystick and a whole ton of other sensors um, like humidity and a gyroscope. Uh, it looks uh, very, very interesting. Yeah, the, this came out of the, uh, the Pi in the Sky, the, the Raspberry Pi going onto the ISS and started off, I think, as like a, a much simpler little board and slowly but surely more and more sensors got added to it. And the really great thing is that as part of the, the program for it to go into space, code developed by children in schools is actually going to be included on the Raspberry Pi itself. So the uh, the projects and the, the work it's doing in space will be based on things that came from school children, which is amazing. I mean, this is just really a s amazing piece of hardware for the Raspberry Pi. It's super cost friendly. Like Joe was saying, it comes with a ton of sensors. The 8x8 LED matrix is just beautiful. I, I want to buy one. I for sure do. I, I think I would highly recommend to all of our users to check this out. Yeah, it plugs into the GPIO pins, but you can still have access to them kind of through this board as well. So it doesn't even limit anything. Yeah, and if you're not into the hardware, you can uh, also just uh, go contribute to the software. It's over on GitHub, and we'll put that in the show notes as well, uh, how to reach that uh, GitHub repo. Yeah, the, the great thing with the uh, the software is that they're doing it with Python 3. So Carrie Ann from the foundation, uh, during a big speech that she did in uh, Australia, sort of said Python 3 is what they're promoting for education. You know, there's no reason for anybody to be using uh, 2.7 for education at this point. So they've made all the resources and the libraries available for Python 3. Um, every time somebody talks about Raspberry Pi hardware uh, coming out of the foundation Somebody always asks the question, what's happening with the, uh, the display that takes advantage of the DSi connector that's on, well, on every single Raspberry Pi sitting there doing nothing yet. And the most interesting that I saw in the comments was Liz Upton saying that you won't have to wait long. So this display was announced probably over a year ago, if not longer. And they're kind of saying that it, it's very imminent that the uh, new Raspberry Pi official display should be coming soon, which would be fantastic as well. Yes, that's pretty awesome. And going on with our news, it looks like Sky Academy is doing well and having fun. And I read over this story, and I really love what Sky Academy is up to. The, the pictures they're producing are amazing. This flight tracking software they're using to display what's going on is also amazing. And I'm just really amped up about what Sky Academy is doing. Yeah, I think it's uh, Dave Aikman is kind of the main person behind it from the, the hot air balloon standpoint. Um, he did one of the first earliest projects. And if you listen to any of um, Evan Upton's uh, speeches or, or any of the presentations that he did, and if anybody asks him what his favorite project was, it's always been the, the hot air balloons. So it looks like uh, David has packaged up some of what he's done for himself into a set of tools so that 
other people can do it as well. So it, it is it, it is really amazing. And I had the, the pleasure of meeting Dave at the first uh, Eggham Jam that I did. So he's a really, really good guy. And it looks like more and more people are going to be able to do the, uh, the aerial photography and send more uh, balloons into space with Raspberry Pis on them. Awesome. We'll have to uh, get him in an interview sometime soon because I would like to hear more about this. Yeah, yeah, de- definitely be good to get a, uh, a follow-up on where things are at now. And uh, another news item which I know very little about is uh, RAS BSD. So, guys, do you know much about uh, BSD? Yeah, it's something that I have looked into before. And I've, I've got running, um, although it is quite different from Linux. It, it's similar in some ways, but then there are some fundamental differences in how you install software and stuff. So I did put this image. Uh, it's a free BSD-based image onto my Raspberry Pi 2 and I got it up and running but it's it needs some knowledge it needs some previous BSD experience basically or a lot of time googling how to solve the problems because it's very bare bones there's no graphical desktop or anything it's not like Raspbian or Ubuntu Mate that we talked about last time where you just boot to a desktop and you can it's essentially like any other computer this is more aimed for kind of server type stuff and command line stuff. But it is great that it's yet another operating system that you can run on the Pi uh, and potentially even more ARM based devices soon. They're talking about now there, you could have BSD before, I think on the Pi one, but I think this is the first port of BSD for the Raspberry Pi two. So yeah, excellent news. Yet another operating system to add to the list. Would you recommend that listeners play with uh, BSD on a normal, I mean, other than a a computer besides the Pi first, or is this a good way for them to learn a BSD experience trying to install it on the Pi? If you want to jump in head first, right at the deep end, then this would be the way to do it on the Pi. But if you want to have a kind of easier introduction, then Ghost BSD is the best bet because that's just a, a standard graphical desktop and it's, it runs as a live session, and it's pretty much like Ubuntu Mate. There's a Mate edition of it, and that gets you further along initially, and then you can start getting under the hood with the terminal and stuff. So it really depends. If, you, if you're looking to get down and dirty, then this is a great way to do it on the Raspberry Pi. But um, if you want an easy introduction, then GhostBSD is your best bet. Was this image on the, uh, the raspberrypi.org downloads? No, it's not. It's a, you'd have to search for it. It's a, a separate link. Okay. But yeah, we'll link to that anyway, so you um, can check it out if you like. But another bit of hardware that's been released is the Witty Pi. And what that is, is real-time clock and power management for the Raspberry Pi. Now, one of the downsides of the Raspberry Pi that I've found is that it doesn't have uh, a, a CMOS equivalent battery like you have in a laptop where, or a desktop machine where if you unplug it, it, that battery keeps the time. And then when you turn it back on again, it's, uh, you know what time it is. The Raspberry Pi needs to go out to the internet and find the time, which generally speaking isn't an issue. But if you've got a project that doesn't use the network, that isn't going to be on all the time, then it is handy to be able to know what time it is for it to know what time it is. And so this add-on board does just that and more. It also allows you to schedule when it boots up and when it powers down, and you can decide the interval between that and how long it's going to be on. And it's also got a power switch, which is something the Raspberry Pi is lacking. So, I mean, I know the point of the Raspberry Pi was to keep the cost down, so you couldn't expect to have these features. But now for around about £10 or $15, US dollars, you can add all these features if you want them with this add-on board. Yeah, it's great. As I said, to me, when I'm looking at this, I'm going battery-backed or battery-powered Raspberry Pis that only need to switch on for a small amount of time each day. So if you're doing remote monitoring and you only want it to come on, we say, for two minutes every two hours, with this you can set uh, scheduled jobs using cron jobs to get it to turn on, get it to read its sensors, shut itself down, and that way the project can stay in the field a lot longer without actually uh, needing to replace the batteries. And there's a, a great video uh, review by Alex Eames on his website that we can link to as well. Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, have been just waiting for this, and uh, it's a real potential addition to a lot of projects, as you say, especially battery-powered stuff. Yeah, this is, I think, the beginning steps of the Pi. I don't think the Pi itself needs to gain larger in size, but I think there needs to be more additions such as this to really maximize the power to the next level. And I think we're starting to see the beginning steps of that. 
forming up with the witty pie. Yeah. And moving on our news, we have a really cool project that consists of a fish tank monitor. And I don't know about you guys, but I had an aquarium when I was a kid. And it's a real pain in the rear to keep track of what's going on with that thing without like watching all my fish die, which I think I was like the master of doing when I had an aquarium. So this is a really cool project that I think really takes a basic concept of using the pie and ma- uh, manages to keep a tab on your fish while you might be at work or at school. Yeah, and from reading it, the temperature sensor that they use is part of the uh, the Cam Jam uh, number two kit. So uh, the guys we're talking to today, they're part of the Cam Jam, and it, it's one of the kits they've put together for about seven pounds, which contains a waterproof temperature sensor. Yeah, good stuff. And a, a little bit more light, a little bit more uh, fun. The the Picade is now available for sale from Pimeroni. This was actually the first UK Kickstarter. Um, so it's that long ago that it came out first and then they kind of lost the way when we're doing other things. They said, right, we're not going to make it available. It's a, a full kit of parts other than the Raspberry Pi to uh, build your own mini arcade machine with proper arcade joysticks and arcade buttons. You just install uh, RetroPie, which I think we mentioned last time on the Raspberry Pi, and it gives you a, a full desktop mini arcade machine at home. What is the uh, cost of one of these? I think the UK price is £180. Uh, pounds. But it's a, a, a very solid piece of kit. I mean, I've looked at buying all of the individual arcade quality buttons and joysticks. Um, and when you put in the screen and you put in the, the parts to manufacture it, you, you probably wouldn't get it for that, that little. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a really good price. There's been people at my meetup there trying to put together arcades. And Albert is correct. When you're starting to factor in the time and labor of the materials you need and also the heavy electronics that go into hooking some of this up because it, it's not as easy as it looks when you start hooking all that up directly. And uh, the fact they're doing all this for that cheap is really nice. And it's a great piece of equipment as well. Well, staying relatively lighthearted, you put this in, Isaac, about someone who has decided to control his bathroom fan with a Raspberry Pi and relays. Rather than just buying a Humidistat fan, he's decided to go way overboard. <laughs> I don't know why you were slamming this project exactly. I think this is really cool what he's put together. And uh, it, it looks like it's not too hard to do, but a, a little bit more advanced than like a normal project. And what I really like is, is uh, the charts he put together. They show that it does work as well. And I've, I've dealt with bathrooms before that don't have fans, mainly in apartments. And I think this is like a very cost efficient way because most time in an apartment, you're not allowed to just cut into the walls as you know whenever you please and i would like to give a shout out to uh, david hunt for putting this together i think it's a really cool project love everything he did with it uh step-by-step instructions i don't know what joe was getting at this is an awesome project no okay look it's the kind of thing where you do it because you can do it because you what the, the process of doing it is the reward in itself you know it's a tinkerer's project there is a, probably an easy way to do it but this is just the fun of it is setting it up isn't it so no i I do understand it well also i've heard people slam the raspberry pi for like why do i want to set all this stuff up with a server where i can use digital ocean to do all this it's just that same concept so i agree with you it is a little bit of a takers project but it's still really cool yeah yeah and just a quick follow-up to end then uh, we talked about mycroft which is the artificial intelligence system based on raspberry pi and their Kickstarter is looking almost there. It's around $80,000 of the 90000 that they are looking for. So do check that out. I mean, even John O'Bacon previously of Canonical, the Ubuntu project, and now with XPRIZE uh, has done a video to promote it just totally independently just because he thinks it's a great idea. So, um, yeah, we'll link again to the Kickstarter and we'll link to that video. So do check it out. It looks very, very interesting. I've pledged my money towards it, so I'm looking forward to it. Really hoping this works out for everybody. Yeah, yeah. With that then... Let's move on to the interview. We're now joined by Michael Horn and Tim Richardson, who run the annual Pi Wars. So welcome, guys. Hello. Hello. So I suppose introductions first. Michael, if you go first, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm Michael Horn. As a day job, I do computer programming with databases and websites and that kind of thing. And with Tim, I co-run the Cambridge Raspberry Jam and Pi Wars. Okay. And Tim? Uh, I'm Tim Richardson. My day job is I'm a performance architect. I 
test computer systems, uh, the performance computer systems, mainly websites, to check that the um, they're able to handle the load that's expected um, on them. And uh, as Mike said, uh, the pair of us organise the CamJam. We run those uh, four four times a year. Um, plus, we uh, we do pie wars together. We both live in the same town, so uh, um, we've, we've been friends a lot longer than actually um, Cam Jam had been around, and, and the pie has been around, actually. So um, when the pie came out, uh, we uh, started discussing that, and then uh, went through a few jams, a couple of jams together. Mike was originally organising, and then uh, I came in on the third jam, and uh, everything's gone from there. So for people who may not be aware of what Pie Wars is, could you give a... a- quick description of what it is and what it's all about yes um pie wars is a um a, a many many of you may have heard of robot wars um or in america i think they call it um monster bots or something like that there's a there's an american version of it uh, i can't remember the exact name but it's um that is actually a destructive uh robot on robot event we are actually because um pies are uh, uh, a lot of children involved in. I want to damage people's equipment, so um, we we it, Pie Wars is actually a non-destructive uh, challenge event where a robot has to uh, uh, complete a few different courses, a few different events, and uh, see which one is uh, is the best. Um, we feel that. Uh, Getting people to compete and to actually do a, a proper challenge will get them to to make themselves learn uh, a lot more about the pie, about programming the pie, about sensing the real world around them. And many of us have, uh, with pies and with other devices, have made robots, but uh, and it's fun to drive around. But it really only we start learning when we actually have something to do with them, a competition or a, a challenge. And that's that's really where Pi Wars comes in. And it's uh, um, this is its, its second iteration and uh, coming up on the 5th of December. And uh, we've got quite a few entrants this year compared with last year. Last year we had about 20. This year we've accepted 32 out of 47 entrants. Unfortunately, some are disappointed, but we can't accept everybody. It's going to be a long day as it is anyway. So, is. Uh, yep. so uh, yeah, Pi Wars is uh, uh, somewhere for people to compete with their robots and improve on them year after year. So is Pi Wars a... Pi, Raspberry Pi robot only event, or is Arduino's BeagleBone robots allowed as well? It's strictly Pi only. Um, the robots have to be controlled at their core by a Raspberry Pi. However, you can use other boards in conjunction. So we've had several robots compete, which had Raspberry Pis controlling Arduinos, which handle things like sensors, and then the Pi then controls the motors and any combination thereof you can think of. So you're allowed to have multiple pies as well, then? Yep, you are allowed multiple pies. Um, I think this year we've got somebody who wants to control a Raspberry Pi robot with a Raspberry Pi, which should, should be quite cool. <laughs> yep. Brilliant. And, and how did uh, the Pi Wars go for you last year? We were um, pleasantly surprised. <laughs> uh, first time, obviously, last year of, of, of organising uh, such an event. And um, we we didn't know how it would turn out, but um, we, we, it had been really ruminating around our, our minds for uh, a year or so. And people were uh, that we'd spoken about about Pi Wars were actually keen. Uh, they were really encouraging, wanting us to uh, organise the event. So um, yes, we we eventually did, and um, we were oversubscribed again. Yep. A number of uh, people wanting to to compete, and. Um, it actually turned out to be a really good event, and uh, we, we we suggested that maybe we would run another one, and there was a resounding cheer of yes. <laughs> I don't think we could have got away without saying, "Yeah, we'll have another one." <laughs> so um, yeah, it went it went fantastically well. I mean, there were one or two hiccups, one with, or two hiccups, yeah, with them organising it. But that's it was the first time this year. We 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 got to iron those out. Yeah, last year we um we we didn't realise quite how long it would take to add all the scores up so there was a frantic rush at the last minute to add all the scores up whereas this year we're going to do it differently and they should all be added up as we go along okay and so what sort of age range are we talking about with the competitors 
What's the lowest this year? It's about seven, isn't it? Yeah, about seven. Six seven. or seven. Seven. Um, and I know that one of the show and tell robots is is a grandfather, so sixty to seventy. So it's really sort of seven to seventy. Okay, great. And do you break it down into categories, or is it just um, everyone in the same one? There are two categories. Uh, last year we had um, a price category, price split off uh, below seventy pounds and above seventy pounds, and um, yeah, it's this. It, it it worked okay, but this year we decided actually um, not to put a limit on the cost. It's difficult to keep a robot under seventy pounds. It can be done, but. Um, so we've actually done it on a size at uh, um, A4 and below and um, A4 to A3 size. Uh, how long does the Power Wars last? Is it uh, eight hours of the day or? It lasts from 10 o'clock in the morning till about 6.30 at night. So, yeah, that's uh, just over eight hours. Yeah. By which time we should be well and truly worn out. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah. Had you any, any favorites from last year? Any favourites? Oh, as in courses, yes. The obstacle course, uh, any, I think, is the favourite. Favourite courses or favourite robots? Uh, both, actually. Um, robots, we, we had one that looked like a pirate ship, which I actually really liked. That was good, yeah. That was good. Um, we had another one that was kind of jet black, but had loads of um, LEDs above it. And that, that, that looked very slick. That was. That did well. Um, and we had another robot that was um, tiny. That was Brian's, yeah. uh, Brian Cordill. He made an extremely small robot, had quite a few troubles in some of the courses, but um, uh, he was uh, he was one of our reserves, and he did really well, got his robot ready. And um, uh, that, that actually, uh, I think one of the best parts of the competition was uh, the first pie-on-pie duel that we had on the day was the biggest robot and it happened to be against the smallest robot <laughs> so um, that, that was quite fun but uh, of course wise um, people loved the, ro- the, the, the robot on robot event uh, last year was sumo they were trying to push each other out of, uh, uh, out of the uh, ring and also the obstacle course uh, that, those, both of those were, um, had, the, had the best audiences uh, watching them Okay, and now you mentioned that uh, it's non-destructive, so there's no buzz saws or anything like that. I mean, is that something you might consider for future events to to have a destructive category? Not at this stage. Um, we feel that at this stage that uh, people are, are still learning to build robots, and um, the competitors uh, love their robots. I don't really think they want to uh, damage them. One problem with having a, a, a destructive element is you've actually got to build the arena, basically, to contain them. So you're going to have to have pers- perspex walls, that sort of thing, so that bits flying off a robot don't hit people. And that's really sort of out of our um, budget by, by a massive amount. Yeah, you've also got so many health and safety concerns like flamethrowers, and then, you, then you've got to have the house robots and that kind of yeah, thing. And, yeah. Um, it's all just a bit bigger than we really wanted to go. Um, we'd also need to worry about what venue to use, and we'd have to get somewhere huge like the NEC in Birmingham um, just to house it. Yeah. I must admit, um, I love uh, Robot Wars. Uh, I used to watch that avidly. And uh, I do still like watching uh, the the YouTube and uh, the American version occasionally, but it's it, it's just not practical for unfortunately for for what we uh, we have here. I re- wish it was, but it's not. Oh, okay. Can you give us a sneak preview of any of the challenges that are coming up uh, this year in the Power Wars? Yep, um, we've got seven main challenges. We've got a straight line speed test which is literally go as fast as you can down quite a long course. We have a line follower challenge, which will be a printed circuit, which you have to get around as quickly as you can autonomously. Not quite a printed circuit. Not quite a printed circuit, but <laughs> not, not a printed circuit. A Printed know, course. Printed course, that's the one <laughs> I'm trying to look for. Um, we've got robot skittles, which will be pushable down a down a, um, a gangway to the end and knock over some skittles. We've got one that we call Proximity Alert, which is another autonomous event where a robot has to get as close to a wall as possible. Without hitting it. Without hitting it. We ran that event last year, and somebody had to use a pair of calipers to work out how far away people were because they were really close. 
Then we've got a Pi versus Pi duel, which I can't say anything about because that's going to be a surprise for the day. Um, all they've been told is that they need to hold a wire on the front or the back of their robot. And that's the mystery. And then there's the ever popular obstacle course, which will look similar to last year's, but will have different obstacles on it. And that's the seven. And there are other other challenges uh, during the day. There's um, uh, code quality. Um, with the job I'm, I'm in, code quality is actually highly important. And um, part of learning how to, to program is actually progr- learning how to write good code um, that's readable by other people, reusable by other people. Uh, we've got um, uh, aesthetics. Uh, how good a robot is, uh, how well it's... We've also got another one of uh, build quality. And we've got uh, the Jim Darby Award for excessive blinkiness. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Lights. LEDs. How many LEDs has ah. your robot got? <laughs> how bright are they? Um, a, a guy called Jim Darby come, comes to Cam Jam every time and he's known for giving packets of LEDs away to different people and for being mad about LEDs. Um, so he judges that one. <laughs> Fantastic. So presuming everything goes well this year, what should we expect from Pi Wars next year? Good question. We think it'll go better this year. We've got a different venue, slightly larger venue, well, quite a bit larger venue um, than, than last year. Um, one of the challenges from last year was it's... We didn't know how it was going exactly how it was going to go on the day, and we discovered that uh, there were a lot of people around some of the events, and so we needed this year to um, uh, organise it so you can actually get more people around the popular events. And so, uh, so we've gone for a larger venue. Um, we've redesigned, rebuilt uh, some of the courses. We're trying to uh, make it a little look a little better. Yep, a bit more professional. Uh, last year was a little Heath Robinson. No, they were good, but yeah, Heath Robinson that I built. Uh, so we, we we we've changed a few things. Next year, we don't know. Um, we think perhaps because of the number of entrants we we have, it may need to go over more than one day. Um, it, it may be we have some heats uh, in preceding weeks for people to uh, uh, to compete in in those and then go through to the final sixteen or or, or however, however many. We just don't know. We just have to see how this one goes. Um, see how popular it is. See uh, the the feedback that we get from uh, both people at the event, but also uh, we'd like to hear from people who uh, watch it over the internet. We're hoping to, to get to get some streaming or, or at least some filming so that we can uh, put it online and um, for other people around uh, the UK and around the world to, to see what we do and, and, and perhaps take what we've done with Pi Wars and, uh, 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 and run their own version, perhaps in the States or, or, or elsewhere. What we, what we, what we want to do, for if we do do it next year, what we're always looking at is evolution rather than revolution. So just growing it organically and listening to the feedback because we, we always ask for feedback after our jams and what we've done this year bears a direct relation to what people said about last year's. Yeah. Um, to do with scoring and prize giving and just making it a bit more professional and yeah, um, and that kind of thing. I, I noticed you guys are also selling spectator tickets. How well are those selling uh, from last year's pie to this one? They haven't gone on sale yet. They go on sale on the 26th of August at noon. Last year they went pretty quickly. Yeah, they went. we sold out last year and then some. Yeah. This year we, we're able to accept a, a, a lot more spectators. Um, we're also saying to spectators, if you want to bring your own robots along, please do, and uh, you can have a go at some of the challenges once the main competition is over. So is this, in effect, a, a, a cam jam at the same time, or is it going to be 100% focused on, on the robots? It's 100% focused on robots. 
Um, we, we at one point did investigate doing talks and that kind of thing, but we suddenly realised that nobody would go and watch them because they'd be too busy watching the robots. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and we, we do have some elements from uh, the uh, 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 normal can jams. We're going to have vendors there. We've got uh, quite a range of vendors. We've got some of the, the top vendors in the UK, Pimeroni, Pie Hut, uh, Pie Borg, and uh, uh, many, many others on top of that. Um, we're also going to have show and tell. Uh, we want show and tell mainly focused on, on robotics. Um, and uh, um, we're not going to have the lectures, as, as Mike said. People just won't go. Uh, it's too much organisation for us as well to try and do lectures on, on, on top of robots. The, the focus of the event is, is the robots, is, is the, uh, are the challenges, and to really enjoy and immerse yourself in those. So you mentioned the possibility of the, it happening in the States. I know Isaac's kind of trying to work on that. I uh, don't want to say too much about that at this stage. But um, how far afield have people come to, to do this? I mean, are there people traveling from overseas or, or at least from you know, distant parts of the UK to compete? Um, I think this year it's just the UK, isn't it? It is this year. Uh, last year we had people applying from uh, uh, Germany, Morocco. I think Morocco. Morocco. Oh, this year was Morocco. No, no, no last, last year. year. Last year was Morocco. Morocco, and uh, last year was actually a team from Australia wanted to send their robot over to us and control it over the internet. Uh, <laughs> we, had, we had to turn them down because we just we couldn't see it working, and we just didn't think it, the connection would be reliable enough. Yeah, the Wi-Fi at the location, while while okay, once you get that many people in the event, it's a little unreliable. So uh, they're pretty, but um, in terms of people coming from the UK, they're they're pretty fast fast spread. I don't think we've got anybody coming from Scotland, but we do have somebody coming all the way from Wales and Devon and Devon, yes. And a long way up north as well. Yes. So uh, it, it's it's not just people from from Cambridge. We do have a, a fair few from Cambridge. I think they they uh, a little more encouraged to to apply because it's so close. But yes, we have people from all round uh, all round the country. What kind of numbers are you expecting to to attend on the day? We know there's 32 competitors, but visitors and viewers and other people for the show and tell. Any any ideas of the spectacle it's going to be? Last year, I think we had about 300 people wanting to come. Um, but of course, not everybody goes on the waiting list if they see it sold out. Um, we think we're going to cap it at about 400 this year. And we would hope to get near that. Um, show and tell. Show, between the show and tell and the marketplace with the vendors, there will be about 27 tables worth. So it'll be quite big and they'll be fitted around the courses. So the spectacle should be quite, quite impressive. The vendors take one or two tables. Um, the show and tell take, there's, uh, there's sometimes two per table. So um, there, there'll be an awful lot to see. So for all of our uh, listeners who haven't heard of Power Wars, where would you guys direct them to go find out more about this? PyWars.org. That's our uh, website uh, for, for Pi Wars, and you'll be able to uh, get your tickets um, from a link from that site. And also, it'll tell you about the rules, information, links about how to build robots, and all sorts of things like that. There's a video on there, um, including footage from last year's, so they can, they can sort of see what it's all about and, and what they'll see there on a smaller scale. Um, but um, it will give them an idea. Well, great. We'll put some links in the show notes for people to come and check you out. But um, thanks a lot for uh, giving us your time and coming on the show. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yes, yeah, so that was a really good interview with uh, Tim Richardson and Michael Horn. I really, they talked further afterwards with us three about how they're going to judge according to code stylings that the uh, robots are built with. And I think that's a really cool concept they're doing to help encourage not just coding, but uh, positive coding, readable code, reusable code. I think that's a really good idea. That's something I face on a daily basis at every job I've done with software development. And it's really good to get that in people's minds early on and let them start growing with that. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. It kind of instills that in early stage where people who are doing these projects for the first time, because the Raspberry Pi has really introduced coding and electronics and robots to people for the first time. So it's good that they're encouraging good habits from the beginning, not just the, the output, if you know what I mean, but the input as well has got to be good. Yeah, and they didn't really get much chance to plug their kits, did they? 
No, I think they, they gave it a quick mention. So they, they have two kits at the moment, the Cam Jam number one and number two kits. The number one is effectively a, a traffic light type setup, um, and it's all on a breadboard. So everything is reusable afterwards for your own projects. And the number two kit is the one with the sensors. So it's got the infrared sensor, it's got the temperature sensor in it, and a few other bits and pieces as well. So, you know, they're great kits to begin with. And the, the fantastic thing is, again, they've put together all the resources. So instead of just getting a, a tin full of parts, oh, and the tin is gorgeous, you get all the material as well. So you get everything to help you actually code it up rather than being just left with parts and told, make traffic lights or make a, a temperature sensor. Um, or a motion sensor, they give you the code to help you along, which is great. I, I really want to see this 10. Albert has raved about how nice <laughs> this looks, and I, I, I'm amped up more to see this 10 than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> it is good. It is quality. I must admit it is quality. It was, the re- it was one of the reasons why I bought one, because I just wanted the tin. I had all, <laughs> most of the bits other than the temperature sensor. I just wanted the tin, really. And I had it at the Cam Jam last time, so I uh, bought myself one. And uh, for the Pi Wars, um, we did this interview with with the guys um, a little while back. As of now, the audience tickets are available. So it's three pounds fifty for an adult, and kids are free. Uh, I think they said they're expecting about three to four hundred at it. So start getting your tickets. I, I checked the registration page earlier on today, and there's already a fair few people registered. And I haven't seen the uh, the audience tickets being majorly promoted. So if you want to go. I expect this to be full. I expect this to be oversubscribed and with the waiting list. So get your tickets as soon as you can. If you can't get a ticket, put yourself on the waiting list if you really want to get there. Because if you're not on the waiting list, the chances are you won't get in. Are uh, either of you two going? I personally am not going to be able to make it because it clashes with uh, a bunch of things that go on in my life. Uh, More is the pity uh, because it should be fantastic. Um, But yeah, we'll see about 2016. Yeah, same for me, I'm afraid. I've got a clash that weekend, so uh, not going to happen. But yeah, hopefully next time. But with that then, we're coming to the end of another Pi Podcast. If you want to get in contact, you can email show at thepiepodcast.com, find us on Twitter and Facebook, or leave a comment on the website, thepiepodcast.com. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or find the RSS feed on our site. And we'd really like for people to email us in about some of their projects, regardless of what that is. Uh, just let us know what you're working on and so we can talk about the show and promote it. Yeah, and if there's anyone you think we should be talking to as well, do let us know and we'll do our best to get in touch with them. But for now then, thanks for joining me, Isaac and Albert, and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you again in two weeks with an interview with Kat Lamin to see how our coding evening project is progressing, along with more Raspberry Pi news, interviews, and discussion. Bye. Bye. See you later.